Well, welcome to Pre-Flight Playbook here at Terminal C at Newark Airport. We're in front of Vesper Tavern. Um, my guest today in our third edition of Pre-Flight Playbook is a guy I've known since the day Too long. <laughs> since the day he joined the Dallas Cowboys as a free agent from Duke, and that's Brian Boldinger. You know him from NFL Network and his radio work doing NFL games. And if you're a Twitter follower, Baldy's breakdown is the best thing on Twitter. Thank you. Highly Jack. recommended. Yes, it is the best thing on Twitter. There's no doubt. It's the most positive thing. <laughs> and before I get to that, I just want to say thanks to our sponsor, Life Aid Beverage Company. They make vitamins you'll enjoy drinking. And be sure to grab a Focus Aid or Immunity Aid for your flight or at your local retailer. All yeah. right, and you'll be doing that. I'm I'm sure. I I plan on it. Okay. So before we get into some of the key issues around the NFL after two weeks, Brian. Um, I do want to talk about Baldy's breakdown because I find that the most educational thing, now that's not a high standard on Twitter <laughs> to find things that are educational, right. but if you're a football fan and you're really interested about what's happening in the line play or receivers running routes or breaking off routes mm -hmm. or why mistakes are made or why plays work, that is the place to go. And uh, first of all, what, what gave you the idea to share this wealth of knowledge, basically, you know, at, at, well, you're not really benefiting financially necessarily no. from it. You're just doing it. I, I do it for the fans, Gary. It's it, a public it, service. It, it is a public <laughs> service. I, I don't get paid for it. Um, I, I put a lot of time into it. But what I found was, I, you know, I announced games every Sunday. I did games nationally on Fox. We just saw Kenny Albert go by with right. Joe Buck and Dick Stock. I did games for 12 years there. I do national radio games currently uh, for Compass Media Networks. So, and what I found is either doing the games myself or listening to other guys, Chris Collinsworth or Tony Romo, whoever. When I listened to them, there was just a huge gap between what you were allowed to say in your 12 seconds of analysis right. and all the different moving parts that occur in any given play. And if you're just watching it on television, Gary, like you're just going to see whatever Fox or CBS or NBC shows you, and whatever that camera is, you're not going to see defensive back play or the line play or anything. So I thought, let's give them this missing section of the analysis. I mean, as a reporter and a writer, Gary, you can fill in some blanks, and you can ask poignant questions in the locker room, and you can get answers, and you're going to fill in some of the blanks about why something happened, why something sure. didn't happen. And, you know, the, the analysts on Sunday can give you some stuff. And the post-game shows, they all have some credence. But by and large, the game moves too fast, and it's too complicated. So I thought the only way you can really learn the game is by slowing it down. And that's what I started to do. And I had fun doing it. I did it just, it was fun. I, I enjoy just putting my phone up to a big screen. I'm, I get all the games, NFL films, so I had access to everything. And... You know, as long as I was creating content for the NFL, they didn't have a problem with me using their licensed content. But I just, what, what happened was it got immediate traction. And people started really asking for more and more and more. And then the followers came. And, and then it became, it just became this thing. And now I don't really know what to do with this thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, it got so big. I can only, I can't do every play. It's just physically impossible. So how many do you do a week? Well, I mean, I've watched, I watched the, the, for the most part, uh, out of the 16 games last week, I've watched bits and pieces of all 16, and probably the entirety, outside the special team plays, uh, probably uh, 10 games in the entirety. And then, so how many plays will you then break down on? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm oh, for the viewers, the NFL, for the, for the NFL, I, I did a lot for the NFL in right. all their channels, on different shows, Total Access and NFL Now. But then just for fun, for the, for the fans out there, I mean, I probably did six or eight plays from the Cowboys game and that Cowboys-Washington game, the good and the bad, and, and the Redskins too. Um, you know, I did some things this morning on Eli Manning. I just thought maybe people should take a look at what Eli was dealing with. And if they, if they think Eli is the problem, and I don't think everybody thinks that, but I just wanted to just let Eli fans know that there's a lot going on with the Giants that aren't just because of the quarterback. And right. I, I showed some of the things that, whether it's him or Daniel Jones, are going to have to deal with. Do you get any, if you're critical uh, of a left tackle yeah. whiffing on, on a block and, and you're pointing out what happened and you're just being truthful, mm -hmm. do you get any pushback from teams or from players saying, hey, Baldy, you know, why, what's up with that 
Why are you hanging me out like that? Yeah, well, it's interesting, Gara. I do. And um, I always say, let's go to the film, and you show me something different. But I remember last show was very critical of Todd Haley and Hugh Jackson and the way that they were protecting or trying to protect Baker Mayfield. And I'm a big Baker fan. I did okay. games of his in college. I feel like I know the kid a little bit. And they went to Pittsburgh, and they literally chased him all over Heinz Field. And they did a lot. And I was, like, screaming at my TV, breaking these things down, going, if you don't protect this guy, you're going to screw up the best thing that's ever happened in Cleveland, you know, since Bernie Kosar. So, uh, and the Browns pushed back. Like, they called the NFL. And I heard. Really? Like, you got to. And then the next week they were fired. You know, so I wasn't wrong. But the things I was saying, I wasn't wrong. But the team took it personally. What about the players? Have you heard from any players? Well, like I was critical of Connor Williams at Dallas. Everybody thinks like this, this Dallas offense is just singing along. And it's good. Kellen Moore's made a big difference. They have a lot better talent than what they had with Scott Linehan. It's, it's a talented team. Devin Smith, former Jet. Like, he looks like that kid coming out of Ohio State. Yeah. Now. But, uh, you know, it's funny. Four years later, he, he looks like that guy. But the, the left guard, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And he did not have a good game against the Redskins. And I just pointed it out that either he has to get better or they have to work around him or they're going to make a change. But you can't, if you're going up against Aaron Donald or you're going up against DeForest Buckner or Fletcher Cox or Akeem Hicks, these elite players that can change the game, right. you, you can't have that play inside like that. It, it, it can ruin you, especially if you get to the postseason. And the Cowboys season is going to get measured by how they do in the postseason. So you, you start to talk a little bit about Eli and Daniel Jones. What is your evaluation of not only what the Giants have done by, by benching Eli and, and starting the rookie, but uh, do you think based on what you saw from the first two games that it was warranted? And is there anything that Daniel Jones' skill set, um, as part of his skill set, will be more conducive to the Giants scoring more than 15 points a game? Well. Yes, he does have a different skill set. I mean, I've said, look, look, I went to Duke Gare. Like, I mean, there's not a lot of us in the NFL. You know, we don't have a big fraternity. So when a, a Duke athlete gets you never, drafted. You know, you know we're bragging about Duke when Dave Brown was the Giants quarterback. But well, now that you think yeah, that well, Daniel Jones might be all right, so I went to I Duke. Think we're look, I think we're looking at a different player, although Steve Spurrier did coach Dave Brown. <laughs> um, Steve's had some successes. But I think, you know, I, I said it when he was drafted. You know, you nobody watches Duke football. I'm sorry. I mean, they watch Duke basketball. Sure. You know, they'll, but they don't watch Duke football, and so nobody really watched this guy. And nobody's sleeping out in front of the uh, no. stadium yeah, no, the no, night no. before the game. Yeah, Shashevskyville doesn't exist <laughs> before football games. So I, I remember I went to meet Daniel Jones when he got drafted, and I didn't know him, but I, I mean, I knew of him. Yeah. And I knew the coach real well in the program, and you know, they haven't had a player drafted there since Jameson Crowder was drafted by the Redskins. So it. it, it but they've won two straight bowl games at Duke with him. So somehow they're, they're beating Temple and other te good teams in bowl games with him. So, like, there's something about it. So then you watch him. And I said when he was drafted, like, this is the best athlete to play quarterback for the Giants since maybe Y.A. Tittle. And I didn't see Y.A. Tittle, but I heard he was a good athlete. Yeah, he was. But my point was, it's been a long time since a guy. Well, actually, really Fran Tarkenton moved pretty well, too. But at the end, did he? Well, well he went to Minnesota. So to Min Al he's with the Giants for five years right. in the middle of his career. Yeah. So. But I get your point. But, but <laughs> it's been a long time since I think a guy could extend plays, get out of harm's right. way. And really, he was so good in preseason against lesser talent right. that he really didn't have to show it off. In fact, I don't know if he ran once in the preseason. So, but he, he does have that ability. If things do break down, he can take off with the ball the way a lot of these guys can. So, I mean, I don't want him, and nor should anybody want him to do that regularly. But... He has that ability, but he's shown the ability that he can beat you from the pocket. But, I mean, he's still going to throw to T.J. Jones and Cody Latimer and Evan Ingram. It's going to be the same guys that are routinely dropping balls and aren't beating man coverage. So, I mean, you know, we have seen this, that certain quarterbacks spark teams. Right. And they respond differently. Now, I don't know all the things that went behind this change so early because it's the same team that Eli started with against the Cowboys two weeks ago. So it's, it's the same team. You can't say you're giving up on the season after two games. That'd be silly. But if, you want, if you're going to start the Daniel Jones era, then when you drafted him, you should have started. It kind of, I won't say defies logic, but 
it doesn't make any sense if they were going to bench him after two games. Why bring him back at all? I mean, what, you well, know, well, if, I mean, if you're you going to go, go half a season, back. you go. You can certainly go back if you made that. If you made that decision in April that Daniel Jones was going to be your guy if he's there with the sixth pick, if you made that decision, and by all accounts, they made that decision. Um, they've done all their homework. And, and, and really, when you look at Daniel Jones and you watch him, he is Eli. He's like his brother. He's more athletic, Eli. He's more athletic. He was like what Cooper Manning, <laughs> by all accounts, were. Like he was the best athlete right. of the Manning. Like, he's Cooper. So, but he sounds like him. He, he'll, he'll present himself the way Absolutely. and he'll behave like Eli. And he looks like Eli. And he's the same size. He is a better athlete. But if you made that decision, April, then just – it's even like what the Browns did with Baker last year. Like, you take him number one, and really, Tyrod, you're, not gonna, you're just going to give the job to Tyrod. You're not even going to let him compete. When as soon as he stepped on the field against the Jets, everybody knew that he was the better player. Right. So I'm not saying that Daniel Jones is better than Eli, but if that's your thinking, what – because as soon as he was drafted, what was the question everybody asked? What week were we going to see Daniel Jones? Let me Jones? ask you this. Do, do you think they needed to see him in the preseason, and he had a tremendous preseason, completed over 80% of his passes. Do you think they needed to see that first to become convinced themselves that he can play this early in the season? And maybe when they drafted him, they said, well, he's coming from Duke. He's going to be a huge transition. We don't want to throw him in right away. We'll go with Eli. We know he'll keep things respectable. But as soon as we're convinced, and they became convinced earlier than yeah. even they anticipated. No, I think it's a good point. I think you're right, Gary. I think it pushed up the whole process. Right. It went from, we'll keep them, you know, on the sideline as long as we can, you know, until after they watched them, and re regardless of the competition and who he was throwing against, he was impressive. Um, you know, with, with the, the reads, the touch, the whole thing, and I think that did push up the whole process. So, I mean, you were involved in some quarterback drama in your days in Dallas. Um, tell me what it's like in, in the locker room now where Eli has been very popular. Mm -hmm. The difference perhaps of that the locker room will not split over this is because there aren't a lot of guys that are in there that have been with Eli for five or six years. It's almost a completely new team where the loyalty to Eli is not would have been what it would have been to say if Chris Snee and O'Hara and all those guys were there. So based on your experience and knowing the mindset of players, what do you think it's like around the Giants this week? Are they all in on Daniel Jones? Do some of them feel bad for Eli? Will that impact? Um, you know what, Garrett? I think this team is searching for a way to win a game so badly right now. Look, their best player is Saquon, obviously. And so, you know, Saquon... I think he'll have all the respect in the world for Eli for as long as he's a giant. He understands, like, Eli has taught him, I think, in some ways. I mean, Saquon came in unblemished. But I think the way that Eli has been looked at and sort of icon, you know, the icon that he is, I think Saquon would want someday to be sure. that guy, you know, and, and he has the chance to be that guy. And so I think. He'll do everything he can to help him win a game. And I, look, Kevin Zeitler, you know, I mean, he's been here for six months. Um, Remmer's been here for six months. You go through the roster. There's not that – Will Hernandez is just going to try to be the best Will Hernandez he can be. I th and defensively, they're such a mess. I mean, I think a lot of these guys are literally fighting for NFL lives. Right. And I don't think the loyalty that you would say, like a Sean O'Hara, like that type of guy, I don't think – you really have those type of right. players in that team. Which could make the transition. Yeah, it's going to be awkward. and It's going to be awkward on Sunday against Tampa. It just is. And the camera will be on him, and that will look awkward, and all of that. But ultimately, like, they've got to win a game. Like, they, like they're on a collision course with the Jets in Week 10, Gare. Like, they, we know what it, it's possible in Week 10 that they could play each other for – their first win. I mean, it's so I, I think the Jets are. I do too. Look so bad only because they're all, they're all no, banged I, look, up. I, I agree. But you know, Luke Falk has got to try to win a game, and it's terrible in New York right now. But I, look, if Daniel Jones goes out there and he goes down and they beat Tampa, and he plays well, Gettleman will and all the all these guys will. It, it almost forget about Eli.
the whole thing will kind of go away. Yeah. What's your feeling, uh, and we'll move on to some other subjects in a second, but everybody's now assuming this is it for Eli, uh, at least as the Giants start, or whether he'll have the opportunity or even want to be a backup here for the next couple of years so he can keep his family here, keep his career going, or whether he's going to want to go someplace else and try to start. It's clear there's not much left to his career. So five years after he finishes playing, he's eligible for the Hall of Fame. What is your opinion? And I have a vote and I have a very strong opinion about this, but how, how do you, is he a Hall of Fame player uh, based on his two Super Bowl runs or the fact that he is the epitome of mediocrity because his regular season record is 116 and 116. So do you, do you put the player in who won those two Super Bowls and beat Brady and Belichick, beat Favre and Rodgers in the playoffs at Lambeau? Or do you say, no, you know, those, were, th those two runs were an aberration and the real Eli does not deserve to be in the Hall of Fame? Where do you, where do you stand on uh, that? I, I, I think it's clear he's a Hall of Fame player because of those two runs. And to take down the 18-0 Patriots and stop them from perfection. And he made the throw to win the game. And, and it wasn't just the Super Bowls. It was the road to the Super yes. Bowl. It was being the wild card team and winning four games and going to Green Bay. You know, and all those games that you can remember. Like, I think sometimes there's a lot of mediocre players in the Hall of Fame. But Joe Namath is in the Hall of Fame because of what he did primarily in one game. In one game. And if you look at the numbers. And he didn't even throw a touchdown pass in that game. They ran, and they didn't throw a pass in the fourth quarter of that game. I bet, but he's in the Hall of Fame, and nobody really disputes that. Right. He's a Hall of Fame player. I think when you look back and you step away and you go, okay, there's been 53 Super Bowl winners, and Eli was the quarterback and captain of two of those and the MVP, and going to San Francisco and beating that game, you know, beating that team, a great team, and a, a day where he was, like, literally – put right into the field of candlestick, candlestick right. you know, like embedded in the turf of candlestick that day. And they found a way to, I think he's a Hall of Fame player and, the, and his longevity. You know, you can debate a lot of things about Eli, but the problem with Eli is he doesn't get hurt. And he never gave anybody an opportunity as a backup or for them to draft anybody. But that longevity, certainly like, look, Brett Favre's a Hall of Fame player, but that longevity travels to me. It's an impressive thing, especially we're going to get to it here, I'm sure. But all the quarterbacks that have gone down here in the last two weeks, yep. like he never went down. Right. Never. People have used a comparison with me. Well, Jim Plunkett won two Super Bowls. He's the only quarterback to have won two and not be in the Hall of Fame. But I say Eli was just a much better player. Plunkett, I won't say he was along for the ride with the Raider teams, but he wasn't like a dominant player. In any phase, in any any part of those runs that he's had with the Raiders, they had a great, great team around them. The first Giants team that won the Super Bowl was 10 and 6. Mm -hmm. At the time, that tied the record for the worst record of a Super Bowl champion, okay. which the Giants then broke well, four well, years later the with a 9 and 7 team that won the Super Bowl. So he really had to step up his game in those in those runs. And I listen, I have a vote. There's no doubt in my mind I'm voting for him the first time he's eligible, but I can tell you I think there's going to be a lot of negativity in that room if he, when, if he makes it to the final 15 on his first shot when we discuss all the candidates, because I know how some people feel already yeah. that, that the two Super Bowl runs should no, not overshadow the fact that he didn't win a playoff game in any other season besides those two years, and they've made the playoffs once since 2011, haven't won a playoff game since 2011. Is this really a Hall of Fame quarterback? And I just say, you know what? He beat Brady and Belichick twice. But, but, you know, but if you look at their teams, Gary, you, you mentioned their records. They weren't good teams. I mean, they went to Dallas, and they were the number one seed, and they were a great team. That's right. And they knocked him out. You know, and, and he played. And look, when he beat the Patriots the first time, he was flawless. He, he was flawless. Now, you can say Asante Samuel, if he intercepts that ball, it never happens. You know, and then they make the, the throw to David Tyree, you know, in the next play, and they have life. But those things happen in football games. Uh, the, you have to look at those marches. And they were not – they just weren't great teams. But they were a, t a great – they weren't great talent, but they were great teams. And Eli was 
the best part of those teams. The thing people forget about the Tyree catch is that was probably the most nimble Eli has ever been on any play in his career. Getting at it now, maybe the maybe the whistle should have blown for in the grasp, and the referee was a little lenient there. But the fact remains, he had four guys grabbing onto him, and he wiggled his way three. But, but Gary, you would agree. I mean, these aren't Parcells' teams that won Super Bowls. There's no LT. Right. You know, there, there's no Carl Banks or Harry Carson or Mark Bavaro. I mean, these weren't Jumbo Elliott. These weren't those kind of teams. Now, this these this was a a team that got into the. I mean. Th- didn't they get spanked by the Jets at home, right, and, and get beat really bad on one of those Super Bowl runs? In 2007. Seven. I, I want to say, like, there was a, maybe a Jets. I mean, maybe I've got that wrong there. I don't want to speak out of I remember in 11, that was the Victor Cruz 99 yeah, yard. Sure. Yeah, that, yeah that was, maybe that was the year. Okay. Um, so I agree. I think he's a Hall of Fame player. And, um, you know, Brady has told me that first Super Bowl loss – still eats away at him because he thought that Patriot team, and he might have been right about that, uh, was on the verge or was going into that game the greatest team in NFL history. I don't think there's any doubt if they had won that game, they'd be known as the greatest team in NFL history for a single season, and the Giants prevented that from happening. Well, I mean, Randy Moss had the greatest year of a wide receiver ever. I mean, nobody could stop Randy Moss, right? And so, I mean, they were scoring, they were putting up 40 every week. I mean, they, they ran everybody out of the gym. Now, that last game against the Giants gave the Giants, obviously, you know, they played, and they didn't have to, and they played, and, you know, that was... The regular season, you're yeah, talking about, yeah. Right. Um, so that, that draft class was Eli, Big Ben, Philip Rivers. Mm-hmm. Roethlisberger has surgery the other day, or is having surgery, mm-hmm. but he's out for the year uh, due to an elbow injury. They must really be sold on Mason Rudolph to then turn around a few days later and trade a number one pick for a safety. I thought they would hold on to that pick and what's going to be a good quarterback draft. And who knows, the Steelers could wind up having a top 10 pick in 2020. What's your, what's your feeling about Rudolph and, and the idea of trading? Uh, now, Fitzpatrick is a young player. And he's really, really good, but he still doesn't pay, play a, what you'd call a premium position. And to trade yourself out of the first round when you don't know what's going to happen this year, I was really surprised. I was shocked. I was shocked here. When I heard about that trade and I saw the terms of it, now I know people went out of Miami, but you tell me what Minka Fitzpatrick's best position is. Like, I don't know. I, 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 see, I think he's a nickelback. Now, maybe he can play for Mike Hilton, who's their nickelback in Pittsburgh and upgrade that position, and maybe the Steelers are thinking, okay, the offense is struggling. They struggled with Ben. The receivers can't get open. Um, you know, Dante Moncrief has been terrible, just awful. Um, James Washington, Ben didn't trust James Washington. Maybe he'll flourish with Mason since they were a great combo at Oklahoma State. Um, but I thought it was, and, and for the same reason you just ex- explained, they might very well, especially if they lose to San Francisco this weekend, they might very well be a lottery, lottery type pick, a top 10 pick. And, and if Mason Rudolph doesn't work out, they're going to be in that market, right. regardless of what happens to Ben. They're going to be in that market. Now, I happen to like Mason Rudolph. I do Big 12 games on Saturday, so I've done a lot of his games. I might have, I mean, in fact, I'm going to look it up today. I might have done his first start um, in Stillwater. I, I seem to think that he, his first start I did. So I, I was around him. But, you know, the one thing about him, he's big, strong, and sturdy. He is athletic. He ran for a third down conversion on Sunday against the, uh, against, uh, the Seattle. Um, he's got a good arm. He's a smart guy. You know, there's, but, you know, he's never played. I mean, nobody knows. Now, he, he played well. The receiving core is a problem whether Ben played or not. I mean, sometimes you don't know how much you miss somebody until they're gone. So, Antonio Brown not there looks like the biggest loss ever. What are they doing with Juju? Is he just getting a lot of doubles? Well, Stephon Gilmore took him out of the game in the first game. And last week, I thought Shaquille Griffin did a good job on him. I mean, he got one big play down the field off of a trick play. And other than that, like, he really has been pretty invisible. I know you're not a doctor, but, you know, Ben having a serious elbow injury. I just remember Joe Montana had an elbow injury in San Francisco, and he missed like two complete seasons almost, or it might have been. Is it Tommy John? Is that what they're that, saying? That's what I was reading. I'm not sure if that's what they wind up doing. But obviously it's serious enough 
that he gets hurt in the second game of the year and he's out for the year. Um, the Steelers have reached that point, kind of like with the Giants, in a different set of circumstances where they really need to be thinking. And they just gave Ben a new contract, I believe. Yeah. yeah. So they intended for him to be there for a while. Um, we don't know how he, how quickly he's going to come back or how effective. I mean, no. an elbow or shoulder injury for a quarterback is about as bad as it gets. Yeah, I agree. So, what do you see as a, as a when you think, Baldy, when you think that two years ago, they had Antonio Brown, Le'Veon Bell, and Ben Roethlisberger, probably the best combo of, of skill mm -hmm. position players, mm -hmm. one of one in each position in the league, mm -hmm. and now two of them are gone. And we don't know what the future is for Ben. I mean, it just right. shows how quickly no, things No, I mean, look, you, it's a year-to-year -year business. It just is. You, you, you're, you think you're building for five years and things like this happen. And so there is the, your plan has got to be fluid at all times. You just have to have a, a core base the way the Patriots do. Uh, and, look, you can throw some other teams in there right now. But, you know, the Rams look like they have that core base. Sue's there for one year. He's gone. But Aaron Donald, Goff, I mean, they've kind of like – identified their core players with a hot coach, you know, that everybody seems to be in love with him for good reason. And so, and they've got a great system. So everybody's chasing that. The Eagles might be that. Dallas might be that. But, you know, until they win consistently in the postseason, they're not that. Before we get to can anybody possibly beat New England, um, let's just go to the other quarterback who's yeah. uh, big news this week, obviously Drew Brees. Um, the thumb injury, going to be out probably at least six weeks. What kind of impact? I mean, can Teddy Bridgewater step in there and, and run this offense efficiently? They, they've invested a lot. They gave him $8 million, dollars, Gary. And they, they gave and they him they a kept him from pick. going And they kept him from going to Miami. Right. So they have invested. Now, he wasn't good in preseason. Taysom Hill was a better player in preseason. He wasn't good last week. Now, you could argue all these things, you know, the left guard went down, Aaron Donald's on the field, he was just disruptive, his all get out, um, all those things. But look, I've talked to Teddy, um, you know, about staying there, and he really wanted to learn from Sean and from Drew. I mean, he wanted to, he could have gone to Miami and probably been their quarterback. They, they inquired and were considering it. Uh, he could have made that move and been the guy probably. But he wanted to learn and improve and really learn the mental part of the game. It remains to be seen. Now, the one thing about Drew, he orchestrated everything, Gary. The run game, the pass game, got him in, out of bad plays, in a good place. He did all of it. Now, it's intense study all week long. There's a preparation that is almost unmatched in this whole business that he does. I, I assume that Teddy will do the same. Um, but you don't know how he sees the, the field. I mean, right. Michael Thomas led the league in receptions last year. And I love Michael Thomas. But... Drew Brees had all the faith in the world to throw it to him when he's covered. And he just knew that he was either going to get it or nobody was going to get it. Right. Well, and that was a big part of their success. They threw, I mean, Drew Brees threw to Alvin Kamara and Michael Thomas. And really, everybody else was an afterthought. Right. Is Teddy going to rely on those two guys the way Drew did? Well, if he was paying attention, he will. Well, we'll find <laughs> out. I mean, I, I think it's a lot to ask, to ask Teddy Bridgewater. to Because I don't think this offense is nearly as effective if you put anybody else in there, except for Drew. They're so, Drew and Sean Payton have been so united. Yes. Is it 14 years now, Gary? I think 2005 till now. Right. I think it's 14. 2006, I think. Uh, okay, so 13 or 14. Yeah. It's been a, over a decade. Yeah. That they've been joined at the hip. Now, they also went through three seventy-nine seasons, back to back to back. And, you know, and they survived that. And then they had this infusion of Thomas and Kamara. And, right. You know, now people forget about that. And some good defensive players. Yes. I mean, they, they've really been building up the defense. This, to me, not only will be um, not only a great opportunity for Bridgewater, but and an opportunity for him to show, you know, whether he's a winning quarterback. But I think there's an awful lot on, on Sean Payton here. Breeze was a great player before he got to New Orleans. He just had that shoulder injury mm -hmm. at the end of his career in, in San Diego. But here he's got third week of the season, integrate a, a, a new quarterback into his system with a team that is a Super Bowl-ready team with Drew Breeze. And let's see now how far... I agree. How, how can I think we all learn a lot. I think we learn about Sean. I think we learn about how well-built the team is. Look, the Eagles win a Super Bowl with Nick Foles. We have seen backups 
step into situations. The Giants did it when right. Phil Simms went down. We have seen Super Bowl teams win with non-starters at quarterback. And, they, and it was a testimony to how the team was built and how the team was coached. Like, Sean Payton can't give Teddy Bridgewater Drew Brees' playbook. It's just not fair. I mean, we have seen Billy O'Brien do that with quarterbacks down there in Houston, give him Tom Brady's playbook and expect him to be Tom Brady. It's just not fair. You can't, no matter how much meeting time Teddy has spent with those two guys over the last two years, there's just, and Teddy hasn't played a meaningful game of football in four years. Like, it's got to come back to him a little bit. All right, I just want to let people know again, you know, thanks to our sponsor, Life Aid Beverage Company. They make vitamins you enjoy drinking. Be sure to grab a focus aid or immunity aid for your flight or your local retailer. All right, so we'll, we'll take. It's such an unusual situation in week three. We have the Cowboys favored over the Jet, uh, the, um, the Dolphins, Dolphins, and the Patriots favored over the Jets, both with point spreads of over 20 points. Yes. Um, I think the last time they said that happened was week five of the 87 season, but that was a re a w the last week of replacement games. Yeah. And the funny thing, what I remember about this, and you might also, is well, I was that in Dallas during that time. I know. The, one of those three games was the Redskins Cowboys game because the Cowboys had a lot of players. We had seven that crossed the line, and seven of our best players. And and the Redskins, now, did you cross the line? I don't know. No, I, no, did I, not. I did not think so. Um, the Redskins had nobody. Yep. So it's understandable why the spread was so big in that game, and then the Redskins wind up winning the game. Right. Okay. But obviously, it's an extremely unusual situation under any circumstances to be favored by that many. So let's take the Patriots first. Mm -hmm kind of give me games back to back now at Miami and now the Jets with their third string quarterback. So I don't know that we've really got an accurate indication of how good they, they now they dominated Pittsburgh mm -hmm. in, in the first game, but Pittsburgh and Miami, they played the Jets this week. Right. The Patriots. Yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. I, okay. I thought that's what, okay. Yeah, so they dominated Pittsburgh yes. in the first game, New England did, and then they go to Miami and, you know, that's just a shell of a team. Obviously they're tanking and now we're not going to really know how good they are by how would they beat the Jets by. But they have that look that they had in 2007 where they're just steamrolling people. And I know you, you're you amazed somewhat by how they can just plug and play different guys and it almost doesn't make a difference. And I think it's Belichick and it's Brady. If it was Belichick and somebody else, I'm not sure it would work. If it was Brady and somebody else, I'm not sure it would work. I just think those two are just in a, almost an unbeatable combination, and then you just got to fill in the pieces around them. What, what's, your, what's your take on what you've seen from the Patriots so far? They're just the, what they demand from their players is just unmatched. I mean, they're on their third left tackle and their third center this year. Ryan Izzo is a seventh round pick at tight end, taken over for a Hall of Fame tight end. Antonio Brown was picked up on a Saturday. And the following Sunday, a week from the following Sunday, he's catching his first touchdown pass on a throw that was drop dead perfect. But he still has to trust the receiver is going to adjust to the ball in the end zone. Uh, you know, and he's, and he's catching a pass on the second play of the game, on the fourth play of the game, right. and on the sixth play of the game. Like, like, and, and it's a timing offense. And, and this guy. I mean, either the offense is incredibly simple or Antonio Brown is the greatest study that we've ever seen. But he's integrating the offense from the first play. And so, but Marshall Newhouse came in at left tackle and he's integrated in there. And that's after they've gone through Nate Solder and Trent Brown and Isaiah Wynn. And here's Newhouse off the bus stop and you wouldn't know the difference. They ran a play inside the other day. They didn't move one Miami Dolphin off the line of scrimmage. They ran a trap wham combination and they just angle blocked them. You know, and Rex Burkhead went for 16 yards up the middle. I, their thinking is just different than everybody else. They cut Jamie Collins, Gary. You know this. They cut him in the middle of the season a couple of years ago. He was 
not doing what he was. Oh, that's when they traded him to the Browns. They traded him to the Browns. Right, yeah. The Browns let him go. Now he's back playing for the Patriots. And starting next to, uh, you know, Dante, the high tower inside. So is it just the culture? Is it the system? Is it that players just raise their level when they get, when they get in that environment? I think it's a lot of that. I mean, look, have we heard a tweet or anything from Antonio Brown since he's been there? I mean, he's been fighting with every single player, coach, like for six straight months since he was out of Pittsburgh. Juju Smith. Or like, you know what I think it is? I think they took his cell phone, they gave it to Brady, and he, and he put it the same place he put his cell phone during the flight gate, yeah. and nobody can find it. All right, okay. And they smashed it in a million pieces. But we haven't seen a tweet from him, Gar. I mean, this is a guy that lives on Twitter. He lives on social media. You know, and he, I haven't seen anything from him. No. Like, do they, I mean, I, I, do they send him to the principal's office and they read him the, the riot act and, and then it just stops? Like, this is a guy that has been out front and outspoken on all levels of social media. We haven't heard a word from him. So do you think that he's just getting used to, no, I won't even say getting used to his surroundings because he was firing away as soon as he got to Oakland. Do you think the light finally came on with him and saying, this could be my last chance. I'm on a team that can win a Super Bowl. I'm just going to play football and keep my mouth shut. Or you think Brady got to him? Did somebody get to him? I think there's something. I do think there's a thing there about Brady. First of all, every teammate loves him. Like, he's not distant. Like, he's a guy. And, like, there's no hierarchy. Right. The way we look at him. He's not like that in the locker room. So he puts in the same amount of work, if not more than anybody. So it starts with that. But he never makes excuses. You know, he never really says much. But I think if you just say Antonio Brown, okay, he's been with Ben, and you knew he had, they had differences. Right. And he's with Derek Carr, and he probably thinks Derek Carr isn't. But now he's with the GOAT. And I think there's a part of him, no matter how derailed he seemed in the last year, that – if I can't make this work with the GOAT, then it's on me. Right. Like, there is no other pointing the finger. Like, it's on me. If I can't make it with Bill Belichick and Tom Brady, then it's all on me, and this thing will all blow up. I think it's part of that. But then, you know, if you look at, like, you know, Josh Gordon, obviously the demons have gotten him at Baylor and Cleveland and all these places. But you, if you just watch the game and don't even listen to a game, just watch it, you could tell Brady loves this guy. You, you just can tell. Like, he trusts him. He puts the ball up there, up on the rim from 40 yards away, and right. lets him go get it. He knows this guy's talented. And he probably knows he needs this guy to win another Super Bowl. And I don't think he's counseling on his personal life in any way. I don't think he crosses that line. I think when they leave at the end of the day, they leave. They're men. But I think when they show up at practice, like, he can't wait to impart all the little things that can help him and how he can help the offense. You, you, and I think, like, Brady gave Antonio Brown a hug the other day when he threw the touchdown pass to him. I think, like, he, like he's lost Wes Welker, and he's lost good players because of money, contracts, whatever. I think Brady also knows, when I get elite players in here, I better make this work, too. So assuming that Brown, at some point this season, does not wind up on the commissioner exempt list because mm-hmm. of that civil yep. suit that was filed against him, do you think... It's just a matter of time before he explodes and becomes Antonio Brown again? Or do you think that he can be like Randy Moss was for a few years until Randy made himself so upset about his contract in the middle of his fourth season knowing that they traded him uh, to Minnesota? But, you know, Randy was on his best behavior there for at least three years. Do you think Brown could be Randy Moss 2.0 and just says, this is the most incredible situation for him to be in, I'm getting paid money, you know, I'm just well, I don't want to take mind. a shot at John Gruden and the Oakland Raiders. But maybe it's something about being in Oakland. And then you get out of purgatory and you go to the Patriots. Because Randy Moss sat in that bench for two years in Oakland. And he knew that they had no chance of winning. Like, like he, he just, you could just, his body language was just awful. Right. And literally, I don't know if they played the Dolphins in his first game. I think they did for some reason. And, like, they're just throwing jump balls at him in the end zone. He's just toying with guys. Like, the, the, the freakish athletic talent that we all knew he had all of a sudden was back on display. Obviously, Brady's setting a new standard for excellence at an advanced age football-wise. Um, have you seen anything in the first two games 
that would indicate to you at all that come December, you should, Patriot fans should no. be worried that it's going to slow down a in little fact, bit? In fact, I see the opposite. Like the throw to Antonio Brown was a, just, a, just a missile. It was just an airstrike. I mean, you couldn't throw the ball any better. The second throw of the game, he was looking left. He came back over the middle. Antonio Brown was sitting right between the two linebackers. And he put it, like, if you, if you f took a freeze frame of what it looked like and you bisected the two linebackers, the football would have been right in the middle. It would have been just a perfect throw. I was just going to say, I just want to remind people that we're, you're watching pre-flight playbook here at Terminal C, Vesper Tavern at, yeah. at Newark Airport. I see lots of people coming, going to their flights. And you know what the best thing about doing the show here is we do not have to get on an airplane afterwards. But, you know, I've just noticed this, Garrett. I, like, I'm usually running through the airport. Right. I'm usually that guy with the hair on fire trying to get to the gate. Like, I, that's how I live my life. And I don't see anybody running like that. They all look like it's a walk in the park here. Well, that's because they get to their flight in time and they can relax, walk into the plane. You're probably one of those guys that gets here and has yeah. to go to the security line and say, my flight's I've left my car running right at the airport and said, you know, <laughs> I don't ship it anywhere. I don't care. I'm going to make this flight. 1995, the last season. 1995, the last season the Dallas Cowboys won a Super Bowl or made it to the Super Bowl. When you think about that, it's the longest stretch in their history by far of, of not getting to a Super Bowl. They've been the number one seed a few times in the last five, six years and, and, and haven't gotten even to an NFC championship game. They look awesome mm -hmm. the first couple of weeks. Dak looks like a new player with Kellen Moore's offense. Mm -hmm. You know, Zeke is running well. Amari Cooper is an amazing player. Uh, even a guy like Devin Smith who hadn't played a couple of years with knee injuries all of a sudden steps in there last week and has a touchdown catch. Can this be the Cowboys year based on um, what the landscape seems to be now in the NFC? Yeah, I do think it can be. I, I do. And because I think the, the standard for how to play has been established on defense. Rod Meyer and Ellie, Chris Richard, there is a standard there of how hard you play. And they have rewarded those players, Demarcus Lawrence, Jalen Smith, Leighton Vanders. There's a standard right now set for how to play. That's good. And I think Kellen Moore was a needed ingredient. There's a freshness to it. Dak is having more fun than I think he's ever had, even in his rookie year. Well, I think more fun when he gets paid. Well, and I think he knows that's coming. <laughs> you know, and I don't think, you know, Dak is, but I, I talked to him at training camp a couple times this year uh, up in Oxnard, Gare. And, th you know, he's always an upbeat guy to begin yeah. with. I mean, he really is. I mean, he, it's hard to get Dak in a dour mood about just about anything. But I think this, the, the offense and the changes, first of all, I mean, I'm not, I like Scott Linehan personally, but it was stale and the talent wasn't good. The talent is very good right now. I mean, to get Amari for a full season, to get a healthy offensive line, to get J even Jason Witten back, who's got a touchdown in each game, right. um, to get Zeke healthy, training camp, he didn't need it. He just needs to be healthy for these games. Um, it, there's, there's a camaraderie there that, is, that you can feel. And, and Kellen Moore is a big part of it. Kellen Moore is, he's going to, if they get anywhere near a Super Bowl Garrett, he's going to be a head coach next year. You, just, you, you can feel it already. He has a complete command and control. He knows what he's doing. The, his ideas do work, and they are what the NFL is going to. Uh, it's not as extreme as Cliff Kingsbury, but a lot of the pre-snap motion and yeah. shifting and mo that stuff is here. The Rams have been doing it. The Chiefs are doing it. Uh, you've got to try to get the best matchups possible every play. You got to win. Literally, try to win every play. Are you surprised at uh, how well the offense is done? Is the, the guy's 30 years old? He's a coordinator for the first time. Um, did you think maybe more of a breaking in period? Did you know enough about what his offense was going to look like? that you're not surprised at how innovative he's been. I didn't know what it was going to look like until I went to training camp. That's why I wanted to go. And that's why I went twice. I wanted to really look at it and study it. And, you know, it was, you know, there was a lot of injuries then. Zeke wasn't there. So there was probably something that was a little incomplete about it. But I knew in talking to Dak and talking to some other players what it was going to include. And the one thing, when you watch Dak, though, like he's very meticulous. He really enjoys the mental gymnastics of 
motioning, shifting. His ball mechanics have always been very good. Right. Carries out fakes very, very well. He knows uh, how to disguise things very well. He's always been very crafty like that. He's not the least bit, uh, he's very detailed in his work. And you can, and I think he really enjoys all of that. And then when the play works, I think he really is enjoying the success, and they've had a lot. But I think just the way Sean McVay, people had questions. When you are around Sean McVay, there's no question he's a head coach. And not just head coach, he could run, you know, the Vesper Tavern. Like, you just know that guy's in control. Like, he's just that kind of a guy. Now, I can't say all of his disciples that have come out of there are that kind of guy. Everybody wants that offense. But I think there was something about Keller Moore. He was like that at Boise State as a player. I watched him, you know, in, with the Detroit Lions beat Tennessee one day with just being a below average athlete, but right. very smart. And these guys, like, if you look at Frank Reich and Doug Peterson, like, these backup quarterbacks are your head coaches. They spent a lot of time studying. Uh... They spent a lot of time studying, and, you know, they're, they're going through the, the mental part of it all game long. And then they're helping out the starters. I mean, Doug Peterson helped out Doug Peter, um, Brett Favre probably more than anybody. Right. You know, the golfing buddies, talking football ideas, and keeping Brett, like, on track when he would want to go out there. So, Boldy, I want to finish up by taking us way back when we first met in Dallas in 1982. And I can't tell you how many people have asked me this question over the years. When Landry used to have the offensive line stand up before the snap and then get back into the... Yeah. Can you just explain, and I know the answer, but can you just explain the reasoning behind that? Because it's funny how all these years later, people are still intrigued by that. Yeah. Well, I, I thought it was really innovative. I mean, for one second, whether it was Jack Lambert or wherever the middle linebacker was on the other side, he couldn't see who was in the backfield. Like for that one second, you took your eyes off what was going on in the backfield. Was there an eye back set? Was it the back shifting? Did they motion? Because we did a lot of that back then. Um, we were probably the first team to really have a true slot receiver in Butch Johnson. So we did a lot of that. Um, a lot of three wide receiver sets when that was not the norm. We did a lot of shotgun when people weren't in shotgun. And so for that one brief second when we all stood up and went back down, it was also, it was, to, the defense took their eyes off the offense for a second. And then it was also like this unity thing. Like we all kind of did this thing together. And it was cool. In 30 seconds, give me your impression of what it was like to play for Tom Landry. Well, I'll tell you one, one game that said everything. Yeah, we opened up the 1983 season, you'll remember, on Monday night in Washington. We lost the NFC Championship game in Washington in 1982, my rookie year. And we were the first game on Monday night. And in that game, they literally, in the first half, we had negative yards. We had three points. It was uh, 24. Four to three at halftime. And we were completely run out of RFK Stadium. And, you know, in RFK Stadium, we could barely fit the whole team in one locker room. Right. But I remember we all came in there. We all had like this glossy look in our eyes. I remember Landry stood up after everybody got, his, he got everybody's attention. And he just said, you know, we haven't done one thing right tonight. But we're about to. And I'm not changing anything in the game plan. We're going after Vernon Dean on this first drive. And we're going to score in the first drive, and we're going to stop, and we're going to score in the second. And we scored in our first four drives of the second half. And by halfway through the fourth quarter, the Redskins fans were leaving the stadium. And I thought, like, that moment, like, he was unwavering about his beliefs. He was a great man, and I, he was my favorite coach to cover, and I was around him. Did he know. ever say anything to you, Garrett? Like, did you ever feel like you got information? I always felt like... Tom just knew how to play the game, but he didn't really impart anything for guys like yourself. Here's the best thing I can say about Tom, is that he never lied to me. Oh, okay. And uh, I always appreciated yeah. that because I can't really say the same about some of the other coaches yeah. that I covered. So I want to thank everybody for joining us here on Pre-Flight Playbook here at Vesper Tavern at, in really beautiful Terminal C mm -hmm. at Newark Airport. And I want to thank our sponsor again, Life Aid Beverage Company. They make vitamins you'll enjoy drinking. So try that out. Be sure to grab a focus aid or immunity aid for your flight or at your local retail. Brian, thank you so much. It's Pleasure, always yeah. great to see you. Thanks, man. We'll be back next time with Bill Cower, former coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers and current member of the cast of CBS NFL Today. Thanks again for watching. And have a great flight if you're about to get on one. Yeah.